Hello everyone, my name is Jack and I am terrified because I'm trying something new and it's not related to homebrew content. <coughs> Today I want to make a quick video about the newest Dungeons & Dragons book, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Post edit. This is not a quick video. I lied. And it's got everything you can expect from a Wizards of the Coast book. It's got DM tools, puzzles, spells, group patrons, controversies, and most importantly, subclasses. It's the talk of the town right now, and I would like to throw my hand into the ring and speculate on what we can expect from these subclasses. I'll be making my predictions on which subclasses show up, which ones might get cut, what changes I would expect to them, and my overall thoughts on them. Then, once the book has been delivered to our dirty little hands, I'll try to make another video to see how much I got wrong. This isn't going to be a highly edited video like most of my other videos. I just have way too much on my plate. Cause I've lost control of my life. But this topic means a lot to me, and I do love me some speculation. So hey, let's try something new and see if this works. These are my opinions and my incorrect opinions alone. But let me know in the comments of your thoughts of these subclasses and my predictions. With that said, uh, let's begin. So what do we know so far about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything? Well, according to all of the promotional material and Reddit documents that have been released since the time of this recording, we know that there are 22 new subclasses, 5 additional subclasses that have been reprinted, and the Artificer class, which has been de-Eberronized for the medieval modern age. If we include the Artificer's 3 original subclasses, that makes the grand total of subclasses to 30 subclasses. For my upcoming unprofessional analysis, I'll be referencing the last big player compendium, Xanthar's Guide to Everything. This is important when it comes to the reprinted classes, which I'll be talking about first. In Xanathar's Guide, there were 31 subclasses, with 4 of them being reprints from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, the Swashbuckler Rogue, the Mastermind Rogue, the Storm Sorcerer, and the Sun Soul Monk. The reason I'm bringing these up is because when they were reprinted to Xanathar's, they were not updated or revised. They were pretty much the same as their Sword Coast counterpart. There were two minor clarifications that were added to a swashbuckler feature and a sun soul feature, but it didn't drastically change how they functioned, they just made it easier for players to understand how they worked. So with my first prediction, I think this will repeat itself for the five upcoming reprints. The Order Domain Cleric and Circle of Spores Druid from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, the College of Eloquence Bard and the Oath of Glory slash Heroism Paladin from Mythic Odysseys of Theros, and a Blade Singing Wizard from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. But there has been some slight bit of news about the Blade Singing Wizard. According to Dragon Plus Magazine, this book also contains a new version of the Blade Singer. This has caused quite the stir. We don't know if that means they are completely remaking it, or if they are making some slight adjustments to it. In my questionable wisdom, I think they'll be doing two things to the Blade Singer. First, they're going to remove the Elf Race requirement because <clears throat> that was dumb. And second, they are either trimming the giant text about the Bladesinger styles, because that took up half the page, or they are adding the styles into the subclass as a new feature. If the styles weren't important to them, then it wouldn't be that large in the first place, so I think they'll be adding it into the subclass as a meaningful feature. They'll probably add some clarifications to the features as well, just like they did with the Swashbuckler and Sun Soul, but I don't think they're going to change the Bladesinger that much. Next up is the Artificer class and its three subclasses, the Alchemist, the Bowsmith, and the Broken One. These were released in the Eberron book that came out last year, and they are officially coming to the Forgotten Realms this year, but without all of the Eberron flavor. I think they're just going to adjust it so that anyone anywhere can become an Artificer. They might rename a feature here or there, but I don't think they're going to modify or balance out any of its features. But for those that do want some rebalancing, especially with the Artillerist, then I got some good news for you. I think we'll be seeing some class variants for the Artificer to fix some kinks in its shiny armor. The Unearthed Arcana, which talked about the class variants, came out around the same time as the Ebron book, so it didn't include any Artificer variants that were requested by fans, because it just came out. But it's been a year since then, and if the wizards were listening to our cries, then it's possible that they've included some Artificer variants to the cauldron as well. Now it's time for the subclasses. I've already talked about some of these in great detail when they were first released, so I'll just quickly go over what I thought about those as I get to them. We know that the 22 subclasses are most likely from Unearthed Arcana. There are 24 Unearthed Arcana subclasses that are alive right now, and if we take away the two newest ones that were just released, 
then we got the exact 22 subclasses that we are looking for. It is possible that there has been some changes of plans for a few of these, so I've prepared a wildcard selection of subclasses that we could be seeing from this book, which will be later on in the video. WILDCARD BITCHES! Yeah! What? What? I'll be going over these in the order that they were released, which means that the first one is... The Path of the Wild Soul for the Barbarian. I've covered this one in the past and my opinion is still the same as before. It's just a barbarian that multi-class with a wild magic sorcerer. The reception to it has been eh, so it's possible that it's been removed. I think that if it does come back, and I think it will, it'll be much more balanced out than before and I think the wild surge options will be scaled back as well because some of them were a little much, a little too much. Next up is J The Way of the Astral Self has been a guilty pleasure of mine from this lot, from the memes and the ridiculously overpowered features that it possesses. This one could also be removed, some people think it's just too powerful to be printed, while some were annoyed with it being called a JoJo reference, which it really is. I think they'll scale the damage down to match some of the other monk subclasses, but overall I want this one to stay and I think it's gonna stay. Next up is my personal favorite subclass, and then one of my least favorite subclasses. Out of the way, you! The Aberrant Mind scratched my Lovecraftian itch perfectly, and I thought it was just near perfect. I'm biased, I'll admit that. But then it got revised into the Psionic Soul Sorcerer, and I thought it was just fine, I guess. It got rid of the fun goo flavor on it. Damn it, I just want to be covered in lube. What's wrong with that? We do know that it has been confirmed to return, but there has been some confusion on the name. It's referenced as the psionic mind in some articles, so it's possible that they've combined both sorcerers together and added some mind flavor into it. But I think it's just my wishful thinking, and I'll probably stay as a psychic sorcerer without the lubricant. I'll bring this up later as well, but we've heard that the psionic talent die has changed due to its positive feedback, and I think it's greatly needed for this and the other psionic subclasses. I think it was just an unreliable resource to constantly use for your features, and it made a negative impression to me at least of what the psionics can offer. I'm optimistic to see what they'll do with it, and to see if I enjoy its final incarnation. Lurker of the Deep Warlock. It's great, it's popular, it's got this. This is not going anywhere. I ended up liking the diverse abilities this has and all the summoning it can do to affect the battlefield. I'm hoping that it just stays as it is, which it probably will. Next one is, uh, fuck. The Twilight Domain is my number one least favorite subclass from this entire bunch. It's my controversial opinion, it'll blow up the internet I'm sure. The first level features are just incredibly strong and I can't understand what the Twilight Domain is supposed to be about. I might be stupid and am just missing the point of this subclass, let me know in the comments if I am, but I think it's just going to adjust the first level features, especially with the unlimited darkness vision, at least I hope, and it will include some more clarification and flavor text on what the domain really means. It's probably going to stay as well, so we'll just see where this ends up. Next up is the Druid Circle of Wildfire, and I like this one. This one and the other druid subclass have definitely made me interested in playing as a druid, which I never thought I would say. The wild shapes are excellent, and I think they'll probably just fine tune the last two features by a tiny bit. Being a kamikaze is great and all, but I think it should deal a little bit more damage and regain a little less health. Next up is the Onomancy Wizard, who is dead like the mystic. I like the naming idea that I was going for, I think the concept of naming and true names is awesome but I think it just wasn't executed very well. Hopefully we'll see it again in a new light. Next up is the Rune Knight for the Fighter. Now one of my fellow players in my campaign is actually playing as one of these, and after asking him what he thinks about it, he says he really enjoys it. You get some powerful bonus action features, and the ribbon feature at level 10 is great too. However, he thinks it's strange to restrict which items can have a rune, and that some runes are just better than others. He relied mostly on the Storm, Frost, and Hill runes during combat, which makes sense since those were really strong bonus action abilities to have, especially at third level. I think that it'll come back with some rune adjustments, but other than that, this fighter is good to go. 
The Swarm Keeper is the first attempt to make the Ranger not only great, but also fun. I love the swarming aspect of it. I, you can perform your magic and features with a pack of squirrels, or spiders, or even bees, like Dr. Bees. What's this? An overabundance of bees in the workplace? My <laughs> it's staying for sure. I can't think of any major or minor changes to it right now. It'll probably get better with the new Ranger class variant rules. Just as long as they don't f*** that one up. Here comes the revived and phantom rogue. Unlike the psychic sorcerer, both of these versions feel completely different from one another. I like both just fine, but it's hard to tell which version the final version will swing towards. I could see them cutting this just so that they have more time to fine tune it. There are other dead themed subclasses in the Unlarged Arcana right now that will probably not get added to this book, so it's either staying or joining the other dead themed subclasses for another day. My gut tells me that it'll stay, but hey, I've been wrong before. I've also never been right before either. Next is Path of the Beast, and I have to say that I'm completely biased on this one. This one is simply fantastic. I'm playing one in my current campaign, and it's an absolute joy to have. I love the options to change your natural weapons and the Infectious Fury feature. While I don't know how that fits into the animal theme, it's still a great bonus action option to have. My only critique is that I've never really used the level 6 feature, Bestial Soul, more than maybe like twice? I've always just set it permanently on the climbing benefit, since jumping is so scarce in D&D, and we do have spellcasters that can help us navigate underwater, so my hope is that it gets changed into a feature that can be used more often. Otherwise, I think this is great, and it'll probably stay with only a few minor adjustments. The Way of the Mercy Monk is next, and oh boy, is it fun. You get to punch and kick your friends to heal them. That's, that's just great. This is one I've wanted to try, but chose the Beast Barbarian to use instead. So I'm looking forward to this version's final form. I think the Noxious Aura feature might be reflavored to being a field of Mystic Key energy rather than a field of Poison Gas, which, which just feels out of place. Also, I could see them changing the Hand of Mercy to something more... um... beneficial? It could be useful to do on an NPC, but never on a party member. Or I'm just missing its main purpose, so I have no idea. I'm not that smart. The subclass is staying for sure though. Next up is the Oath of the Watchers, the ones that fight outer plane invaders and aliens. I think it's a fine paladin subclass, I just think that the aura is not the greatest choice for a paladin to have. This one grants you a bonus to your initiative rolls, which is fine during combat, but outside of combat it's, it's, it's practically useless. Some Paladin Auras are fantastic because they can be relied on at any time. The Aura is the most concerning thing to change in this subclass for me. I think everything else just works fine. And then there's the Noble Genie, and the less Noble Genie, the Genie. This subclass, along with the Armorer, falls into a strange category that I like to call they've been homebrewed into death because everybody has wanted it in D&D since the very beginning. There are so many versions of the Genie Warlock patron that gives the unofficial version a lot of unfair competition. I don't think a lot of people like the Noble Genie version because of this, and also because it wasn't that great. I think a lot more people have liked the new version more, myself included, but I've already seen great Genie subclasses out there that players will probably still prefer over this one. I think that it's good in its current form. My only issue is that the capstone feature just feels like a free level 6 spell slot that can be accessed every few days. It's already been confirmed to be in the book, so we'll just have to wait and see if its final form can blow all of the other genies away. Another confirmed subclass is the College of Creation Bard, aka the one that brings shit to life. This one just feels like a fun bard college to have. It's got that Sorcerer's Apprentice vibe to it, and if you combine it with the chaotic energy of the bard, then oh boy, that spells trouble. I think that I'll just get some slight adjustments to it, but my main hope is that there's some more lore information in it, so that players can understand what the Song of Creation is, and how bards and DMs can learn and utilize it into their campaign. Next up is the Unity Cleric, aka the slightly better cleric. Although it is a friendship cleric that doesn't have the friend spell, which is UNACCEPTABLE! I love the theme of it, but I think that half of its features are just power-ups for its emboldening bond, which can only benefit two people at a time. I hope that they'll adjust those to affect more people as you get stronger with it, or they'll just change them altogether. But I think overall that it's gonna come back stronger than before. 
The Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is up next, and it gives me so many Xenoblade vibes. Maybe it's because I can only pronounce Mechanus as Mechanus. And all of that time stuff too, can't forget about that. It's similar to the Lurker Warlock, where it can dish out a variety of abilities and powers, some of which are really creative and unique, I, that's really awesome. I think that it's steady as it is, but just like the Creation Bard, I hope there's some more info on the world of Mechanus for everybody to learn and use in their stories. And then there's the Armorer, aka the Iron Man subclass that everybody has wanted for years. Just like the Genie, the Armorer already had some competition from the other Iron Man subclasses that have come before it. But I think the advantage this one had is that instead of coming with a giant list of attachments and armor parts for your suit to manage and look over, you can use your infusions as attachments, giving you more freedom and creativity on what kind of suit you want to build. I personally like that way more, but I'm sure there will be people that will choose their homebrew versions over this one. This one has already been confirmed to return. My only request is that it comes with a medium type armor model that's alongside the Heavy Guardian and the Sneaky Light Infiltrator. Next is the Druid Circle of Stars, and with this subclass, the Druid is 2 for 2 in this batch of UA. It's a really fun circle to see, and I like how the stars and constellations are incorporated into the Druid's magic and wild shapes. It's already been confirmed to come back, which is great. But I think that some things will be adjusted slightly, like the dragon wild shape form, which I think is the weakest of the bunch, and the capstone feature, which feels quite similar to the Lurker Warlock's capstone feature. Hopefully they change that up, but other than that, I think this is good to go. The final confirmed subclass is the Fey Wanderer Ranger. I've actually enjoyed going over this subclass until I continued reading it and I read the final two features. Beguiling Twist feels useless at level 11 since by the time you get it, you'll be encountering enemies and creatures that are either immune or resistant to being charmed or frightened. And Missy Presence is just a buffed up version of invisibility that you can only use on yourself. Outside of those two things, I really like the subclass, and would actually be down to play as one. But it's only if the Ranger variant doesn't shit the bed. Mmm, they're good at pooping. Speaking of shitting the bed, I've decided to just talk about the Cyanide Fighter and the Soul Knife Rogue at the same time. Because I think I share the same feeling about both of them. One's a cool Jedi, and the other is a cool psychic assassin. But they'll have to survive against their greatest foe, the RNG of the Psionic Talent Die. I think both are coming back in their current forms. The biggest change will probably be the Psionic Talon die, and that's either going to make or break them. I'm kind of scared of what it ends up being, but we'll see. And the final 20 second subclass is the Psionic Wizard. Oh wait, that bitch is dead. Question mark? IGN's article featured a picture that was titled Psionic Wizard, so it's either coming back from the dead or this one was an error. I bet it was an error because the true, final subclass is one of the best ones in this bunch. The Order of the Scribes Wizard is another one of my favorites. It, it took its predecessor, the Artifice Archivist, and added its missing element. Fun! Being able to customize and create a spirit from your spellbook is great, and the spell modifying is a great bonus too. The capstone feature is so crazy to use. I don't know if it would come to print, I'll be shocked if it does. Losing spells from your spellbook like that can be devastating. It'll be funny for everybody except you. It just feels like the craziest monkey's paw effect ever, and I, I personally love it. I am excited to see what happens with this subclass. So here are all the subclasses that I think will be in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But with the D&D celebration coming up soon, and more promotional material being released until its release, it's possible that there might be some surprise subclasses being added to it, either as a replacement or as an addition. So I've made some wildcard choices that could be popping up here. But I'm gonna be honest, there's a very slim chance of it happening, so I'm not gonna give my hopes up on them. First up are the six leftovers from the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Half of the Battle Ranger Barbarian, the Arcane Domain Cleric, the Purple Dragonite Fighter, the Way of the Long Death Monk, the Oath of the Crown Paladin, and the Undying Warlock. 
each of these have their own strengths and weaknesses, and I think most people would love to see these revisited, or at least see these in general, since most people don't even use the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide anymore. But for some, like the Purple Dragonite, they would need to be totally revamped in order to be viable in today's campaigns. If I'm wrong about the Blade Singing Wizards revision, and it actually is a brand new version, we could see these happen to the others in this book, or at least happening to them in a later installment. The second bunch of wild cards are from the Legends of Runeterra module that was released this summer. This module was a crossover between Dungeons and Dragons and the League of Legends card game, and it came with three subclasses. I forgot the names of these, so I just wrote down the Sea Barbarian, the Gun One, and Gambit. That, that's all you really need to know. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, I know. They've already confirmed that these subclasses won't ever make it to print. But here comes my Tim Hat theory. What if they give it the old artificer treatment and push it somewhere else? You what? These subclasses, particularly the Gunslinger and the Card Slinger, have been very popular and it was great to see a semi-official take on these archetypes. It is possible that after seeing the positive response to these subclasses, they could work on their own versions of them to be added into Tasha's, or they'll get playtested in a future UA to be added into another book. Gunslingers and Cardslingers have also been homebrewed to death, and they have been endlessly requested. So I think it's only a matter of time before we see some form of these subclasses into official D&D canon. And finally, and finally, there are the two recent Unearthed Arcanas, the College of Spirits Bard and the Undead Warlock. They've only just been released to us a few weeks ago, so I think it's safe to say that they won't have enough time to get surveys out, play test it, and finalize it by November. They'll most likely be held back for another book, and it's possible that the Phantom Rogue can drop out of Tasha's to join these two, since they're all tied to a dead-like theme. Both of them are actually really good. I just think the Bard one needs to be trimmed down a little bit, but I don't think they'll be ready by the time Tasha arrives in our campaigns on November 17th, 2020. Thanks for watching, everybody. And before you go, I have one more wild card to share with you. Now, have you heard of the cursed circle of the- I just